Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the launch of Over Journal. My name is Julia Gillespie. I'm general manager of Photo Ireland and co-editor of Over Journal. Today's event will last for around an hour. We'll kick off with an introduction of our guests, followed by a chat about the journal between writer and Over contributor Aidan Kelly Murphy and Over co-editor Angel Luis Gonzalez. Following this, there will be a discussion between Aidan and artist Heather Agyapong about her practice and latest body of work, Wish You Were Here, before closing with a Q&A. Uh, throughout the stream, you're welcome to write your comments and questions via the chat. We'll collect these and do our best to address them either throughout the talk or at the end of the talk. And um, your microphones are all muted throughout the stream, and the stream is also being recorded, so uh, other friends and colleagues that couldn't make it today can enjoy it in the future. So it's up to you if you wish to have your camera on or off. Um, so I'm gonna hand you over to Aidan Kelly Murphy. Aidan Kelly Murphy is a photographer and writer based in Dublin. He has been the associate editor for Circa Art Magazine since 2019 and the arts editor for the Thin Air since 2017. He's a contributing writer for Visual Artists Ireland and London's This Is Tomorrow with his writing also being published by Paper Visual Art, Critical Bastard, and the British Journal of Photography. So Aidan, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Julia, and uh, welcome everybody. So as uh, Julia said, uh, we're gonna have a chat this evening just about over, and then we're gonna have a chat with Heather about her practice. So just to give you a little uh, a bit of a, a bio on uh, the two people involved. So Angel is the founder and director of the Photo Ireland Foundation, an Irish arts organization dedicated dedicated to promoting critical thinking and photography, as well as other visual mediums in Ireland, and establishing a deep engagement and with the ultimate goal of broadening the visual literacy um, in Ireland. So the Photo Ireland Foundation manifests itself in many forms, from obviously the annual uh, Photo Ireland Festival, which is in its 11th year this year, to the Halftone Print Fair, to their library project hub in Temple Bar, and of course, Over, which Angel, along with, uh, with Julia, is the co-editor of, and Heather is a visual artist, performer, and actor living and working in London. Heather originally studied performance arts at Westminster College before studying psychology at the University of Kent, and then recently completing a master's in arts, photography, and urban cultures at Goldsmiths. Her practice is concerned with mental health and well-being, activism, invisibility, the diaspora, and the archive. Heather utilizes both lens-based practice and performance art, and has been nominated for Foam's Paul Huff Award twice, as well as the 2017 and the 2018 Southbank Arts Breakthrough Artist Award, and this year was the Firecracker Photographic Grant winner. So as I said, we're in esteemed uh, company this evening. So as I said, we're going to have a quick chat myself and Angel, um, just kind of around re-over, and then we're going to have a quick chat then, as I said, with Heather around her latest work, I Wish You Were Here. So Angel, if I can kind of kick off with our kind of first question is, might be a bit of a simple question, but one that maybe have a complex answer. Why over and why now? Okay, um, it is a, a, a tricky question, um, but it's a, I suppose that the answer is that it's um, it's been a more like the process of a, a long period of uh, uh, rethinking um, what we do and how we do it and trying to identify opportunities. Do you, uh, do you may think that you know we just came up with the idea of doing a magazine? I don't know, maybe in the, in the last year, but actually it has been uh, coming on for quite a while. In, in fact, um, I was only talking to uh, um, Julia the other day about this. Um, I'm going to share with you something very quickly. We had uh, in 2010, we had this uh, um, this idea of uh, running what we called. Um, Image based, which was a magazine, uh, pre pretty much portfolio type of magazine, you know, focus on um, on uh, uh, socially, uh, uh, socio politically engaged practices. Of course, um, that cover was the uh, the work of uh, Kutsana Ichirai, um, the Black President in 2018. Um, but yeah, I think it is uh, uh, it is being a big jump between that and uh, over, and I think uh, one of the good Things of this process, uh, in, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, kind of looking at um, uh, photography in, in, in Ireland and, and the needs of uh, uh, opening new spaces for conversation, was uh, having the time to reflect. You know, ten years, ten years is a long period of time. Yeah. It's a decade. 
uh, and you know, looking back and reflecting on uh, how people talked to you when you started, you know, when you finished college, how people addressed you uh, when you were somebody coming out of college, and how people address you now, how people may have uh, may use the, their positions of power in different ways. Uh, do you realize about the structure of the, the art scene and you know yeah. uh, the the politics uh, around uh, funding? You know. It's sort of, uh, I mean, that's sort of like just in, in this kind of um, um, bubble of, uh, of the arts. But I think um, if we expand that to, to the sort of, a social, you know, the social context, um, of course, you know, Ireland and the world has changed quite a lot. Uh, and having the time to, for us to get together uh, and share the type of magazine or type of journal that we want uh, for, 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 uh, uh, for us to read, I think that was uh, uh, what, took a long time, you know. Um, so I don't know if I answered the question, but the yeah, why... I mean, the, the thing that kind of that struck me looking at, say, uh, at this year's festival is, like this year's festival is obviously the, the on and the off team, both through, through online engagement and then through offline engagement. And what really kind of struck me was that if we look at kind of the two of the biggest uh, rises and maybe changes in, in photography over the last while, say, over since the lifespan of, say, Photo Ireland has been the really increase in the rise of the photo book, which kind of mirrors the offline aspect and over itself. And then obviously the explosion of, of Instagram and kind of digital consumption of, of um, visual language. So this year's festival obviously kind of mirrors that. And obviously 2020 has kind of maybe heightened these trends with the kind of shutdown of art spaces and kind of people looking to vote online. And then I know there's a lot of conversations in, in Art Review. Um, in this month, we're talking about the kind, of, the kind of going back to reproductions and, you know, actually experiencing art through, through that. So do you think that maybe this is something that Photo Ireland might, might look to continue, this kind of balancing of, of a hyper online and a hyper offline? Or once things kind of come back down to normal, you kind of see a, a return to, say, the kind of the more blended view? Um, no, I think we, now that we have learned, you know, uh, we have gathered all these skills in terms of how to um, uh, broadcast live, for example. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, I think that the digital is a very interesting space. Um, and, and, you know, we've been following the screen walks for quite a while from Photomotion and Winterthur, and uh, it, this, these are very, very interesting ways to engage audiences. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I can see, for example, Ellie Berry just sitting down there in the sofa at home, relaxing, having a tea. You know how this is great you know yeah. this is such a great way to uh, to actually it's like the google box you know uh, we can actually see each other and um at, at live you know enjoying this this content um and and i think you know this this establishes you know uh, very interesting relationships between humans you know so yeah. why not uh, using this this uh, technology but i think it's a uh, um it's a it's a time you know when when would you when you have uh, time to experiment you come up with hybrids usually and I think uh, hybrids uh, hybrids eventually become um, uh, standards as well you know so I think whatever whatever we, we try to do now eventually may, may become a standard and perhaps obsolete in the future as well I think experimentation is, is part of the process over is a hybrid as well it's it, it's a half an academic journal because you will have a, a, an academic uh, element. That um, that we'll discuss later on, you know, in terms of uh, the calls for papers, articles, and work, and then it's, it's also uh, a, sort of like a portfolio magazine. But it's better to produce uh, for us now with this mindset ten years later to produce it now than yeah. having produced it in 2010 when we will have made a phone magazine, perhaps. You know, yeah. so it, it is for us important to actually uh, do this right now at this point in time. Um, so um, yeah, and we're really happy that we had the time to do it. You know. Yeah, to uh, to give us a nice segue into the uh, into the second half of uh, today's conversation, what kind of drew you to the kind of collection of photographers and writers that uh, are featuring over maybe specifically uh, Heather's practice? Um, okay, I can show you uh, also maybe very quickly. So that's the cover of uh, yeah. Over. Um, the work of uh, Bernard Clova. This is the the, uh, the contents of our journal, the first issue of our journal. I think it is quite a substantial amount of uh, content. There is a, a really great mix of uh, uh, long long uh, form texts um, and uh, and look at uh, looking at uh, three portfolios of uh, work uh, and a couple of articles on uh, a number of artists uh, and an interview. 
Um, it's, uh, it's, it starts with uh, George Corbett asking a very basic question in terms of uh, criticism, which is uh, also something that, you know, he brought, he brought us to mind um, having, uh, uh, with some reviews that we read about the festival not mm -hmm. long ago, um, you know, and kind of reflecting on really what does it mean to have, uh, to, to write criticism in the arts. Uh, to Anna Einstein, where, 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 uh, with her article where she's actually using or appropriating Instagram, if you can say that, uh, to, uh, as she did in her presentation, to talk about uh, decolonizing the, the, the lens-based lens practices uh, in a very, very interesting way, uh, you know, within that format of the long-form uh, texts. Yeah. Um, and Julia is also uh, writing uh, piece on uh, Hiro Tanaka, Francesca Catastini, and Theo Tio Ellison, whose video we'll see later. Um, and this is uh, part of the open call artists that were uh, going to be presented in the festival that eventually um, are presented now through the uh, journal. So, yeah, I think um, I forgot the question, but I can tell you that we have also the work of Teresa Eng. Uh, it's a work in progress and it's uh, uh, super interesting. I had the chance to, to uh, see this. Um, very early on and really wanted to show it to the yeah. world. So uh, it's also nice to be able to show work in progress. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work that is not seen uh, online. Um, I mean, uh, online at all. Uh, and a very important conversation that we had with Marion, uh, Marion Hislin from, she used to run the Circulations uh, Festival and now she works with um, uh, the Ministry of Culture in uh, hold, holding a position that is very, Unusual, a delegate for photography of the, of the Ministry of Culture. I yeah. mean, imagine if in Ireland there was a, a delegate for photography, or in the UK, or you know, it's a very, very where else but in France. So it's interesting to have a conversation with her two years on about that um, uh, position. And then yeah. we have, as I was mentioning, this uh, there will be a call for papers published on the journal, we're finalizing the details, and uh, the back cover uh, goes to. Um, over uh, to uh, the guerrilla girls, uh, giving us a tool for um, activism, you know, so you can actually mm -hmm. use it. Actively. There's, there's going to be a scrap in uh, in my house over which one of them gets the back cover, so I might just have to keep that uh, hidden or <laughs> pick up a second copy. Um, if I can ask then, um, just before we jump in to talk to, to Heather, how did you in terms of over kind of say become aware of Heather's practice and kind of what drew you to, to include it in the journal? Uh, well I think what she's, um, how did I hear about her? I think it was uh, through the British Journal article actually, so it was uh, uh, not, not long ago, uh, but uh, it is a conversation that uh, she's raising in a very interesting way and that you're saying earlier you know in terms of uh, mental health, uh, there are some key uh, ideas being brought up and I think we we have to, uh, uh, we, we want to engage with, with those and yeah, I think it's, um, it's super relevant. And, yeah. uh, and actually it is also, uh, I mean, you, you'll see in the magazine, the, the work is, um, it's also quite beautiful. Which yeah. is, <laughs> it's sometimes, you know, it, it can be as well. It is, kind of, it is one of those things when it comes to, and as I said, just as we, as we uh, switch to chatting to Heather here is whenever it comes to kind of, um, work that can be so powerful as when I was looking at the cakewalk um, when Angel was sharing me the images, it was something like when you brought it up there is sometimes with, with kind of powerful work like that, you can kind of forget the how beautiful as, as images they are and how, how just wonderful they are. So look, as I said, thanks Angel for, for bringing us through over. Um, as I said, I'd just like to uh, welcome uh, Heather to the conversation. Hi Heather. Hello. Oh, um, look, as I said, what really struck me, and I know we were chatting just before the call started, when the when I first kind of became aware of your work, there was this big kind of, um, I guess just ignorance is the only word I can really say when it came to the idea of, of what a cakewalk is and it's kind of its cultural significance. So I know Angel is going is bring, gonna to bring a few images, but I was wondering if you could kind of talk us a little bit through the kind of the significance of say the, the cakewalk itself and, and its importance in terms of a, as a cultural signifier. Of course. Um, so I came uh, across the cakewalk like maybe a year and a half ago, I was reading a script and it said cakewalk so I googled it and um, it just kind of changed the game for me. So basically the cakewalk from what I know is that um, slaves in plantations in, um, in the States 
mimicked their slave masters dancing so on the weekends um these people will dress up and celebrate and do all the things and slaves would oversee this and then mimic these dances and then later down the line slave um owners would watch the, the slaves dance and they'll think oh, what's this interesting jive they're doing is this a native uh, dance but actually yeah. what they were doing was was being quite subversive and yeah. often, right so after emancipation happened um uh, and when black people started entering kind of performance spaces they started reenacting these dances in things like minstrel shows vaudeville performances yeah. and uh there was a contest in philadelphia 1820 something and couples would do perform this dance and the winner would get a big cake so that's how the cake walk kind of started and then it became really popular um in the 19th and uh, 20th century early end of 19th yeah 20th century was it uh, at the time where the obviously the the cakewalk you were saying there was it was used almost as a way of kind of subvert, subversive uh, mocking of of slave owners is it known whether they were aware that this was say an aspect of the dance or is it kind of something that at the time maybe they weren't aware or maybe it just didn't even bother them like was it that known like the research is so murky. Like I'm, I'm obsessed with this, right? So some people are saying they had no idea. They thought it was this kind of um, dance they brought from West Africa. And yeah. then when it kind of got into um, after emancipation and kind of black people had a bit more agency, they started kind of decoding: is this it's us? So by yeah. that time, like we don't care anymore. There's these black bodies performing in this way, trying to be white. And yeah. That fascination was more important than kind of where it originated. And I've actually got a little video, a little clip to kind of give a bit of more context, okay, cool. which might be great to just have a quick look at. From the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. And you might have seen these dances in kind of films or kind of um, this sort of sequence in movies. I've seen them in things recently and they're all kind of derived from the cake board. I was, I, like yourself, well, I'm nowhere near as much, but I, I started researching um, the cake board as well. Uh, I had a talk and there was, there was a lot of kind of talk about the, it's kind of seeping into other aspects of culture. Like some people have said the phrase, a piece of cake, something being easy has been attributed to the cakewalk. And obviously there was, um, in France, there was the, the kind of, I think the, the phrase of this negrophilia, the, the mm -hmm. obsession where the, the kind of the taking or uh, the interest in the avant-garde and people were saying that it kind of blended across and, you know, maybe this, the cakewalk may have influenced uh, things we saw in the Roaring Twenties and stuff like, like jazz dances and stuff like that. And it's kind of what really, as I said, what, what kind of struck me again with, with where I think the, the power of your project is, it's about reconnecting the links between those kind of gaps in kind of, uh, of representation of different cultures across time where there is a break in terms of our historical understanding of what this is and how your kind of project is, is kind of focusing on that. So in terms of we kind of maybe jump into the, the project a little bit, how did it kind of come about with the, with the team at the Hyman Collection? Yeah, so um, when I did discover this cakewalk word and I kind of got fascinated with it, no lie, like four or five days later, um, the Hyman Collection, uh, James Hyman, said he wanted to commission me and said, have you heard of this word called cakewalk? And I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> well, if you said it last week. <laughs> I have actually, and we were just fascinated. And then like five minutes into it, he brings out all of these postcards, like 30, 40 postcards. I've got some in the slide to um, Angel, if you could just um, whack on. Yeah, these postcards, which were just mad. They were these kind of carte de visite sort of images of people doing this cakewalk dance. Yeah. And there were like kids, young people doing it. And then as I kind of got through it, I saw the kind of problematic images coming up, right? I saw they started becoming about animals doing it. And then they started getting just explicitly racist, like yeah. monkeys doing it, black people with big lips. And it, it, it reminded me of 
the powerlessness sometimes of black subjects in photography and that they're often they are there's kind of a legacy of powerlessness even yeah. now you know um so and i me being me is like how can i subvert it what can i do how can i take back because i'm obs i'm really interested in how visual culture affects mental health right and those images although people can say they're historical and whatever they really had a deep impact on me yeah and people around me so that's kind of where wish you were here started and the term wish you were here really is about aida um overton walker so um this woman apparently is called the queen of the cape walk so she kind of got this dance which people mocked and and laughed at watching black people and she was like hey i'm going to make it elegant i'm going to be really um uh excellent at this dance yeah and then she became this kind of herald incredible performer there's quotes saying like she's the best she's the best negro dancer of this century and these incredible things so she kind of she flipped on its head to benefit her and yeah. uh, just if you could and girl if you could just go back to the image before yes yeah so she in my work i always anchor myself on a woman from that period of time so she was my anchor at the start of this and wish you were here that um phrase is kind of a conversation between aida and me because i was feeling incredibly powerless at that moment in time and i felt like i needed aida's kind of courage yeah uh, so i was kind of channeling her in the piece I was really struck by um, that quote, and it's on the screen there. Unless we learn the lessons of self-appreciation and practice, we'll spend our lives imitating other people and appreciating ourselves. Obviously, when, when Ida was, was, was working at the time, there was a gap or a, there, was a, there was a mismatch between what she was allowed, say, uh, the difference in her expression and her representation. So when it came to her performances, she'd almost have, you know, a lot more power um, in terms of her ability to depict her own culture that she wouldn't necessarily have agency over the representation. And when I was looking at your work, I, I was kind of curious about how central in terms of that, like lack of agency and the ability to, to apply an appropriate gaze. So how central was that in terms of highlighting that and then kind of maybe bringing that forward to kind of a modern kind of context and representation of, of black culture? That's a big old question, Aiden. Um, uh, uh, I'm, if I'm honest, what brought me to photography is that question. That is my yeah. kind of primary function of being an artist is about gaze, agency and power. Um, so growing up, I felt like I never had that at all. Yeah. I think a, lo a lot of my psyche or my beliefs about myself were very much consumed from visual culture. How black people were presented, how women were presented, how working class people were presented. Yeah. It was so bloody negative. And, all, and I'm very much a like, visual learner. So all of that seeped in and had really detrimental effects to my mental health. And just the way I like, carried myself, how I spoke, there was a... Yeah, so I really wanted... Um, and Aida, like, if you Google this woman, she was saying that she just, can I swear? Am I yeah. to swear? She was saying all sorts of shit. Like, I don't know how she had the courage to just, yeah. there's an article of her just saying, like, this is bullshit. You want black women to look this certain way, either they're very sexualized or you want them to look stupid. And those are the two forms. And I refuse that. So that sort of, like, courage and power, I wanted to, kind of encourage that in other yeah. black women with the work so it was very central into how I could subvert these postcards so sorry the yeah. cake walk became um postcards people would send postcards with cake walk cake walkers on and it was a craze between like 1901 and 1905 like loads of postcards were being sent of black people just looking stupid doing the cake walk so that yeah. is what I wanted to kind of subvert um, yeah, like when I was I um when I was looking at the the images of the cakewalk online, it like they started out. And I think you had said it earlier there, where initially when you look at them, you mightn't you mightn't see any issues per se. But the longer and longer you stare at them, and I was looking at an online collection, and it was of some guy's postcards, or it was an online digital collection, and it started with the first kind of cakewalk image, 
And then as you slowly went further through, it was like the image became more problematic until the last one was a cartoon of a black man up a tree with an alligator going, welcome to Florida, boy. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And he's like, oh, I, I see it of, I, I seem the further I go down the rabbit hole. And that kind of, when I kind of looked at that and look at your past work when, when you were doing your work and kind of say British identity and, and British uh, and black culture and black history, so I do kind of wonder, say, if, if we look at a kind of a, of a modern context of it, what kind of, say, cultural representation, while, say, addressing, obviously, in, in the cakewalk, you're looking at the historical context, but your work always has, say, a, a modern element. So what kind of things were you looking to, say, challenge on the modern aspect when you were looking and creating cakewalk? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not going to mention any organisation's names, but um, during that time, I was asked to do a lot of stuff about race. I was like the race girl, like you're going to talk about your identity, and and within kind of art spaces, it felt like being a woman and a woman of color, I had very limited parameters of expression. Things like even if I I, I remember I was doing a work around hands and cups, and I took a picture and someone was saying, "What does this mean about race?" And I was like, "It doesn't. It's just my hands in a cup." Like everything felt really loaded. Yeah. So I was just thinking, how can I? how can I um, uh, turn the gaze around or even hide the gaze? How can I just be like, sod you, this is for me. Yeah. And um, like, if you see the work, there's a lot of, um, maybe we can go to an image now, Angel, I've been chatting. Um, Cause yeah, like we, we were saying there about focusing on yourself or really should be is any kind of character that is in there is shown off screen. So we've got an arm coming in. It's, it's other depictations of other individuals are very much out of frame or are slightly ref. And so um, I think there's one coming up of where I think you're pulling someone in and it's kind of, it, it really seems about like reclaiming the personal and reclaiming, you know, your representation of you as an individual. And there are multifacets to that, but it's core is you as an individual. Yeah. I think me, if we go back to the first one, I'm not going to reveal all the sequence of the images, but um, Rob This England was basically Aida. She performed the cakewalk at Buckingham Palace and taught royalty the dance, which I find flipping hilarious because it's kind of like, this is you, but I'm taking this thing. And I felt like there was a lot of conversation la, when I started thinking about this project around reparations and about what is mine and... Uh, uh, kind of like ownership, for example, all got places, buildings which have been built from slave money, essentially. Those yeah. kind of cultural spaces, I've always felt quite excluded from them. But actually, how can I take ownership? How can I feel like this is mine? Yeah. You know? So that was kind of the, the, I was having conversations with myself around ownership. And also, just the next slide, Angel, yes. Also about political manipulation around um, what does it mean to be a person of colour and, and um, being told by your prime minister that you're a picking in, like, what does that mean? What does that do to me? And um, what are the kind of mechanics behind that manipulation? So example, you, you see a lot of um, politicians do this kind of, what are they called? They're called, it's called a certain thing where they're stressing a point and they put their thumb out which we all know is kind of BS, right? So yeah. I was trying to decode kind of the messages I was getting at that time. I was being bombarded by a lot of stuff. And this whole thing about feeling like I couldn't rest being an artist, because at that time, if I didn't have a commission, I wouldn't make any work. Because my yeah. work, you see it, I need people to help me. Yeah. There's a whole thing going on. And being a working class artist, like I don't have any money to do all of this thing. So feeling really like, financially unstable yeah. how can I reclaim this why do I need to chase for money all the time as a freelancer can't you just pay me so there were bitch better was like a Rihanna reference when she's talking about money so all of and I was very much on social media at the time so all of these cultural specific things became really important and relevant to me making the work it, speaking there about, um, I think there's a phrase that I, I saw that you use, which is talking about the, the consumption of negative uh, visual culture and its effects on, on mental health. And obviously, uh, if we're looking at kind of same 
modern kind of meme and gift culture, there can be representations in that that are, are absent of any kind of signifier or maybe a context. So I wondered if you could kind of maybe expand a little bit on the what you mean by, the, say, the consumption of, of negative visual culture and any impact it could have on mental health. I think meme culture, there's a lot of like depictions of black women and the black, and the black women are either like overweight, look silly. There's a, there's a, there's a kind of an, um, this kind of American attitude that people like put up so much around, which, which, um, which are incredibly problematic when you take yeah. them out of context. And I was seeing a lot of them and seeing the people who were using this. And it felt like when our, our culture is kind of lifted a lot, whether it be appropriation, whether it be how we look, and that kind of taking and making into something really negative felt, felt like how I felt actually. Parts of me were really loved and other parts were just not at all. And I wanted to kind of, I wanted to be a full person. So I used GIFs and references to GIFs in the image. There is a, I think the last image, it's like a triptych was a reference to, um, uh, what's that GIF called? It's a, uh, Viola Davis. Oh, where she gets up with a bag and, yeah, and, bag and yeah, she's, I'm done. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes. Because because of that thing of having awkward conversations for me and, and always feeling silent and just saying, yeah, no, I'm not leaving. And I was like, how can I use that to empower myself? So I kind of to took those images from the culture I saw and tried to reinstate mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Um, you've uh, you've been very uh, honest with your with your own mental health um, and the champion of of self acceptance, which again is something that that Ada was was uh, was a champion of as well. So I just wonder um, if we look at say the personal first, like how how do you look to kind of challenge or channel that self acceptance um, through your practice? And then if we look say because I know you've talked about that a little bit, if we step outside it. How do you view photography's ability to do this at a, at a kind of say a wider community level? I think with thinking about the last question, I think there has to be a level of responsibility when you're taking pictures of people outside of your culture. Yeah. Because it, happens, it just happens so much, right? There, someone, we were speaking about this before, someone goes yeah. to community, takes these images, kind of presents it as objective, but saying it's subjective. And then there's a whole narrative for that community or those people. And I feel like there always has to be a level of self-reflection. Even if it's yeah. documentary photography, I think with everything, there has to be a level of self-reflection of how your stuff has impacted the stuff with the photographs you're taking. Um, if we can... If, yes. I was going to say, sorry, if, if there's anything, I'm not going to say we're going to turn this into um, cultural representation 101, but yeah. if there's anything that you could give to... To other kind of say photographers and other artists in terms of you know is there any kind of stuff that you've encountered with other artists where you've gone like if you had just stopped and asked yourself like these kind of questions maybe we wouldn't have encountered this kind of situation i'm just wondering if you have any experiences around that that you could maybe share with the with us on the call definitely do so i did a project in 2015 called the gaze on Agbogloshi. Basically, it was a place in Ghana where I'm, where, I'm, where I'm from, which was heavily photographed. It's, you can Google it. It's like a huge e-waste dump site, right? But um, it's, been people, it's been depicted by so many famous photographers, right? I went there and I speak the language and they told me, you know, people tell us to look, put dirt on our face and pose and cry and, they're, and that we're given money or we're promised education or they take our blood samples and say, we're gonna give them all of this stuff. And I just realized that this place has been heavily exploited. And that became my conversation of like being really self-reflective in what I'm doing and taking, because now the community around that community vilify these people because yeah. the way these kind of photographers are taking photos. And I just, it would just be great if people could just have like a few lines about their, a, re a reflective kind of process they had about the images they're taking just to acknowledge that that exists because it can be it can be dangerous i'm not yeah. going to over exaggerate it can be um for the people you're photographing so that maybe yeah because i remember there was um uh 
there was a BBC uh, documentary and I can't remember the presenter who went there and spent time there. And it really, because I, I, I'd seen the images and it, the photographer's name escapes me now, I think is, is it Peter, Peter Hugo, I think, the South African photographer who has represented um, black communities in Africa quite a lot through his imagery. Um, and I know some of his work has shown in Dublin and that's where that interest came. But I remember when it was a black BBC presenter, I can't remember, I think he might've been like a CBB, uh, CBBC presenter, but went there. And what was really striking was that he went and worked there. Like he didn't go there and he didn't, um, you know, it wasn't there for, doc it was a documentary, but it wasn't necessarily just the standard typical. So went and actually worked there and went through it. And I remember this was a, this was a landscape that I've seen in photo books. This is something that I had, I had seen hundreds of times. And then when actually seeing the there, it completely changed. Like the way he actually described it as being, well, actually this is the, this is the Western world's dump yard. And it was a huge, that, and it was just a simple phrasing of that. And it just completely oscillated the whole conversation of being like, well, actually the representation of this area and these people through photography has shown it as just a very narrow, narrow focus. But then what actually just a small broadering, I yes, I think it was Andy Peters. Thank you, Jamin. Um, so yeah, and it was really like, it was just really, it showed the kind of the real power of just kind of stepping outside those kind of narrow focuses when, when discussing a community. Because before just, uh, when, before we went on the call, myself and, uh, and Heather were talking about, there can be a problem in Ireland um, with regarding the, the, showcasing of the traveling community it seems like a photography college student 101 is go out and take some photographs of a traveling community come back and present then go look at this community and then having no ability to understand visual signifiers and everything like that so as i said uh anyone i will try and uh i'll try and dig out the links of that documentary and i can send it on and maybe Angel can send it to people around because it was really because i'd seen peter hugo's photographs and had very much made an assumption about what this was and then this documentary really kind of kind of changed it out yeah. in terms of um as i said it was kind of i know we we chatted about it before but this the project wish you were here um obviously predates the the ongoing conversation that we're having in a society over the last say month or two following the the killing of george floyd and the black matter black lives matters demonstrations but the issues obviously they touch on are, are central and core issues, particularly around expression and representation. So what issues around representation, as I said, do you feel that this project has touched on that you're seeing in these conversations? And is there anything that you may, if you were ever to make say a, an additional aspect to this or maybe change it again, would you address any different topics or do you feel like you've hit the nail on the head first time? No, I mean, it's, uh, I think, personal example, the day after George Floyd was killed, I just had a flood of emails about people doing commissions and takeovers and stuff. And the reality is that a lot of black people in this country were mourning because that killing brought up all the stuff we've kind of suppressed, all the racist attacks, all mm. the comments we were told, all the ways for an artist our work was kind of skewed or reduced to this kind of base conversation about race. So there was a, it felt like an earthquake and we were like in the aftershock. So all of, a lot of us were just discombobulated. That's yeah. not an issue. And I think um, the work, the reason why the work's suddenly kind of what this momentum was because I was talking about being silenced as an artist and as an artist of colour and feeling I need to make work in this way. Yeah. People have told me you need to keep making work about this sort of thing. And I think the project talks about um, that kind of fallacy, that kind of, that, that if you play up to this thing, like I need to make work or create work in this way, you'll be exhausted and you won't feel authentic and um, you won't, it won't actually be your work. It will be kind of a combination of other people's. So when I made this project, I was just like, F it, I'm gonna do yeah. whatever I wanna do. So I think the project talks about agency a lot and this kind of idea of um, you actually have your own age. You can do whatever you kind of, 
yeah yeah do you know what i mean you can do whatever you want to do and not feel like because these museums are commissioning you in a certain sort of way you have to stick to that so that's kind of what the project's about and also mental health like during that time Aiden I was I was a total mess like I had yeah. deep anxiety I was like I couldn't I couldn't I, I felt like I just wanted to please people within yeah. the art world and and the project was just to kind of like I'm gonna do whatever I want to do and be really honest and and uh I'm going to shout about it. I'm not going to code it in a weird way. I'm going to be really yeah. honest about how I'm feeling. So, yeah. Did you find, um, like, instances of people kind of, say, institutions, again, I'm, I'm not looking for, you know, <laughs> not a name and shame here, but, like, did you find or uh, the situations of people being, like, contacting you going, oh, we, we need, we're going to go chat to a black artist right now. So we will we'll just give, how are you doing? What's the, hey, how are you? And we know we ignore those six emails, but like, mm -hmm. you know, we, we put a black square up yesterday because I, I think I noticed, um, I think I saw a stat, which was, there was 26 million black squares put on Instagram, um, but there was only 12 million signatures to petitions to actually change legislation so there's this huge gap between the I want to put my hand up within my peer group to show that I'm, I'm aligned with these causes but actually the thing that would probably take the same length of time but I'd actually have to you know put my name and maybe uh, uh, lend my agency and my kind of um, lend my position of, of privilege I'm not actually willing to go and do that so I just kind of wondered did you notice that in, in terms of you were seeing stuff in, in your feeds that you're kind of like, nah, 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 nah. I mean, guys, if I could tell you, oh, <laughs> goodness. Like, like recently, there were a big uh, retailer, a big yeah. retailer said, we, Heather, we want to put on your work. We've got no budget, but we would love to put on your work. Like, it's just been so, I would rather people do absolutely nothing than mm. do stuff. And I think, um, What's great is that I don't really like call out culture, but people are yeah. really being held accountable. And I feel personally that if we talk about representation and anti-racism, it really does affect other, like, other marginalized groups. I genuinely believe that. I don't think it's just like, once we sort out the thing with the black population, it's just that. I think it will feed into everything else. That's why I'm so passionate about it. Um, and photography, man, it's just, visual art has just such a profound effect on people. That's why people are screaming about culture right now in COVID, because, because people have realised we desperately need this thing. Yeah. But we also need to, if you love something, you, should, you always want, you want to critique it and make it as best as possible. So this conversation just seems really overdue. Um, but people are being held accountable, which is yeah. great. Yeah. Um, I think, like, when I look at your... Um your your cv your very impressive uh, very impressive cv um not one but two paul huff nominations like I, I know I said it at the start i'll just repeat it for anyone who's here um but i look at say your your educational background and you had started out in in performance arts and you are an actress as well as a as a visual artist and then you moved on to psychology um like your your practice and the way you speak about your practice is, is incredibly admirable. Um, it's conversations that I think more artists uh, should should really be having about how their practice is, how they think about the world, how they process the world, and how they move through the world. And I'm just wondering, if, like when I look at Wish You Were Here, it's almost the now obviously with your other uh, other projects as well, of course. But I I feel like it's, it's almost this kind of this perfect like triangle of, of your background as, as both an actress and a, as a as performance artist looking at the psychology and the mental health and then your most recent in terms of goldsmiths looking at kind of photography and, and urban cultures and what really kind of struck me of like do you think that say would it be beneficial for for other artists to kind of say maybe branch out and like kind of educate themselves in other aspects or or other aspects of, of culture and essentializing mental health and psychology and stuff like that. Is that something that's, that's just as important to your practice as the, as the visual background? And it would be something that you maybe would recommend to other artists to kind of not just focus on visual culture, but look at other kind of sociology aspects in terms of, of their projects. It's tricky for me because I really fell into photography. So mm. the honest truth is when I was 19, I kind of was, 
I reached a point in my mental health which was quite um, uh, dangerous. So I was um, just kind of to look after myself. I was 19 at university. I went onto the Jessup's website and bought a 550D and I just bought a camera and I just started taking photos because I just wanted to focus my attention on something. Yeah. And then I started realizing how photography was like, was very much like a therapeutic tool for me. Absolutely. I started to critically analyze what I was thinking and feeling. And um, it's just so cathartic. And then I found out about Joe Spence and Rosie Martin and these practitioners who kind of use photography in a therapeutic way. Yeah. To be really reflective. And I feel like those personal, um, those photographers which, which touch the, the personal can have real impacts. It's quite vulnerable, like how I'm talking. I'm just being yeah. chat, guys. Like, but I just think it's really those conversations feel it's art, but it's also like well being. Yeah. So um it's 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 I think maybe people don't see photography as a kind of cathartic method, but those properties have been incredible for me. So I would deeply encourage it, even yeah. if you never show anyone the work. I think it's really important, actually. And I think, I think people are also paying attention to this work. Like, people want to see this and want to yeah. be moved or affected. So it's important to have that conversation. Like, I, I do know, like, I think of um, of Joe Spence's uh, work. And I, I remember I first, um, I first encountered uh, Joe's work in, I think I was in third year college. Uh, a friend of mine was, was doing their thesis on it. And it was just completely struck um because it, it was hard like, at the time it was like wow this is this seems really like groundbreaking in terms of the processing of of what she was going through obviously and then what her family was going through and then it almost felt like she was creating a a personal record for herself but also a record of, of women who have gone through cancer in the way she had and then kind of realizing that actually this was like the time period as well of, of 25, 30, well, obviously 30 years ago that she was making it as well. And it, it kind of really, really jumped out. And it's uh, like, it's really, I, I can't start as someone who's, who's had challenges and, and struggles with his mental health in the past and who has used photography as, a, as an outlet for that, like, but then realizing that it's not really something that we talk about. I just, I, it, I have no question here. I just really want to say like, like it's, it's an incredibly like, it really is like a really heartwarming and like really brave and honest thing. And it, it, it genuinely is a real pleasure. And it's really exciting to see artists who we all know go through these thought processes when they're making the work, but maybe don't necessarily want to kind of put that aspect out there for, for critique. So again, that was, again, no question. I just really want to say that was a really powerful thing. And like, there's something I really enjoyed about like looking through your work and looking through your past work about the representation of, um, of black britons um that way again stuff like that like those kind of challenging those and like really putting again it's a bit cliched hard on the sleeve um i know we're kind of getting close towards the 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 wonderful q a uh time but i just wondered in in terms of just to kind of to round out of like are are there any i know you'd obviously maybe said it there that you, you wait for a commission but is there anything in the in the pipeline at the moment in terms of like when things return to normal wish you were here being displayed in in a physical aspect or any kind of plans to to continue or just see what's on the horizon there's loads but i don't know if i can say it <laughs> um, um there is there will there will be a show in november okay. in england and um north I'm, south <laughs> I don't, we'll get there 20 questions i don't even i feel like I'll get in trouble. Yeah, okay. I don't know. But yeah, that will be happening in November to February. Yeah. And um, I'm doing a brand new performance art piece, which I'm so excited about, about how uh, trauma lives in the body and it's about healing. And it's going to be kind of an immersive performance with um, images from this new body of work. Uh, yeah, November to February too. So I can't wait for that. So that's happening, which I'm stoked. Ah, oh, excellent. Yeah. Um, we've kind of, we've reached the, uh, the Q and A section. So I wonder if, uh, to kind of maybe open up to, to the audience to see if anyone had any kind of questions, um, regarding Heather's practice or even in general to, to, to Angel re over. Don't all rush at once. While, um, somebody comes forward with, uh, some questions or notes, um, maybe I can share with uh, with those that are uh, joining us today the um, 
the layout that uh, uh, Heather uh, and I worked uh, on in relation to Over. Uh, can you see it there? Mm. Okay. Um, just, you know, since you have, uh, uh, for those that are joining us, they have the, the sort of like the uh, uh, sneak peek before you get the, the copy of the, of the, of the journal. Um, and I think it's, you know, something that we, well, that I proposed to Heather was to, to instead of uh, kind of uh, um, going in the same way as, as, you know, you would do a, a sort of a, a piece on the work to actually try to use a text to, to draw some of those sort of ideas that you, that you want to shout out and you want to bring to, uh, to um, uh, you know, uh, to people's minds and to, to so people can reflect, um, and many of those quotes are taken from Ada. That's right, no, Heather. Mm -hmm. They're her, and some others are are just uh, sort of like short uh, reflections. Uh, but I thought it was a, it was a nice way to sort of, so, you know, a, a bit more creative than perhaps just uh, you know uh, the informative uh, feature that you you may find in some other portfolio uh, magazine. That's um, yeah, that's all I, uh, I suppose I wanted to. To mention in, in that regard that um, I, I, in the end um, I quite um, uh, enjoyed uh, working on this uh, with with Heather in, in this sense. Uh, I have a question, Heather. Um, what when I was looking at your images, um, what as well as like other research in terms of cakewalk, what what really jumps up there was a, an ongoing um, kind of discussion that I was reading on Twitter about a week ago about. Uh, the images that uh, Annie Leibovitz had shot um, of Simone Biles, the American gymnast, and just there's a lot of it was it was interesting because I was watching like one half of my Twitter feed go and these are amazing, powerful images. These are, are wonderful, which they are, and then there was another half of of Twitter going, these are these are fucking awful. Like how like how can you not shoot? how can you not shoot someone with, with dark skin? Like, and then it just someone to put up a thread of like the amount of times that Annie Leibovitz had absolutely butchered uh, portraits of, of black people. And it was kind of something of being like, it's not something that I, again, I, I consider or, or bring in towards it. So I just wonder when it comes to kind of those kind of aspects in, in terms of technical, does, is there a frustration when you see something like Simone having like this absolutely groundbreaking in terms of having a wonderful cover and then being like, oh, they fucked it up. So I just wonder like, is that a frustration that you have say more as a, as a consumer of visual culture rather than, I guess is that question aimed at that aspect? I think you probably know about this more than me, Aiden, but there's, a, there's this whole thing about, um, is it Kodak film couldn't read black skin? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, though? yeah, that's that's true. It was it was they 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 tested it for. It's like the whole facial recognition struggles with with black people. It's the or like an example you could see is Amazon had to Amazon had to stop using um, an algorithm that they had built uh, for processing CVs because they in order the the training data that they had used was the CVs of the people that they'd hired. But the problem is that they just hired white men. So the algorithm trained itself to hire white men. Mm -hmm. So they was kind of one of those of having to switch it off. So I, people even like right up until the point of actually execution, not realizing, I think it comes back to those, we were saying the questions that you need to ask yourself before you do something are a lot easier to do than after. Uh, on that note, uh, just to mention that the, I think it was just yesterday, um, where uh, UCD a student um, well, the research of a UC student was taken, managed to uh, find that hundreds of millions of images in, in academic uh, data sets um, are, that are used to develop AI systems and applications are partly based on racist and misogynistic labels and slurs. Uh, so, you know, there is, uh, even in this, this digital realm, you know, uh, we are, we're, training, <laughs> we're training the AI to be also, uh, you know, pretty, pretty, you know, racist and uh, 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 gender biased and whatnot. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Mm. I, think, I think because of that, there is a particular sore spot or rawness around color, color and um, skin color. And as an actor, I mean, just not being lit correctly and having the assumption that a blue light will look the same and all of that stuff. So I think it was just triggering for some people. And, Annie Leibovitz. I don't know. She has a particular style, right? Which is whatever. But um, 
there is a thing about black skin and executing the vision rather than the actual the the, the image do you know what i mean so um I think I know, that sort of stuff i'm like oh there's just so many things that this yeah. just feels like <laughs> you know you gotta pick your battles i think sometimes but yeah it was it was a shame to see that it was yeah. a shame. anything from the from the audience Ellie Berry wants us to uh, comment more on a question uh, to say that uh, it's really great to listen to Heather um, uh, talk about her practice so openly and with so much passion. Um, she feels like some artists uh, are almost afraid to, to be excited about her work. So, Yeah, I've, I've, I've visited a lot of like academic spaces and like I'm just, I speak quite late. Like I'm, I have a real passion for accessibility because I think growing up, when I went into museums and galleries, there was a bit of a, you felt like you needed to have prior knowledge to decode the images. And I just never want to feel like that. Again, even though I, I, I write in this kind of way, I also, I want to communicate quite plainly, mostly for me, but also just that's my, that's my mode of expression. So, yeah. <laughs> cool, cool. Uh, absolutely. Um, and then Michael Dooney. Uh, was mentioning um, talking about lighting and representation. Do you think that uh, shows like Insecure are really helping the change uh, to the, nar the narrative and um, educate people? Yes, I think um, shows like Insecure and I May Destroy You. There's a thing around some um, having agency on your creation makes it really authentic, and I think for a long time kind of marginalized communities where depict in photography and visual culture, they've been depicted by people who aren't part of that community. Um, things like lighting, you might not even know about things like that. So it's kind of not their fault, but there is a, there is a um, kind of a, a more rounded view of a community sometimes when it is the person in that community is telling that story or taking that image, I find. Um, just read another comment there. Um, Janeth uh, Bilbro says, that, uh, thank you, Heather. So for forthright and inspirational. Um, Aidan Kelly just uh, shared in the uh, chat the link to the uh, documentary, right? Brilliant. Yeah, and uh, whoever said correctly that it was Reggie Yates, uh, it, is, it was Reggie Yates, so it's from... Uh, it's online, um, so it's Reggie Yates spending a week as he goes into um, into there and kind of works and looks at the the structure in terms of you know how you start out and then kind of it also looks at the kind of the power imbalance and the power structure um, and and race in there. So we, again, it was really, 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 really good documentary in terms of kind of I think it's really, really, really good. It would be. I could recommend someone because what I did is I ended up watching the documentary and then I went straight after I finished it and I looked up uh, Peter Hugo's work and just reevaluated it again afterwards. So again, uh, a really, really good documentary. Um, you can just Google uh, BBC documentary Reggie Yates and it'll, it'll come up in case anyone isn't able to co copy the link. I think we should probably uh, leave it there, uh, Aidan. Um, it's going to be 7 p.m. Do you want to... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I just want to, um, yeah, I think we should just call it, wrap it up. And um, I want to say thank you to Aiden, Heather, and Anhel, and everyone who um, took the time to make it. And um, just to say that Overjournal is available now to purchase online at overjournal.org. Or if you're in Dublin, you can come to the library project and grab your own copy. And before anyone goes, I just want to bring your attention to two final events of this year's Photo Ireland Festival. Um, you can currently switch to 2020.photoireland.org to view a screening of a video piece uh, evolved display from the artist Theo Ellison, whose work is also can be found in the first issue of Over. The piece is uh, four minutes long and will be presented for only the next two hours. Evolved display uses video and computer generated imagery to explore the relationship between artifice and display within image making. Uh, in drawing parallels between image making and the display behavior of birds, the film looks to peer beneath the veneer of its own romanticism to deconstruct those destination points of art we call the show, display, performance, or exhibition. 
And tomorrow is the second half of the Googlified image with a screen intervention by Mexican artist Geraldine Juarez with a work titled The Fish Don't See the Water. And you can find out more about the work and book your free ticket via the Photo Ireland Festival website at 2020.photoireland.org. Um, so thank you again. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll see you soon. <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. Thank you very much. And I, will have to, uh, I have to read thanks to all these people. So perhaps it may be a, a good way to uh, make, invite uh, everybody to leave slowly. Uh, but while you are leaving, you know, I'll tell you that uh, <laughs> Over General is a project by Photo Ireland and the issue was made possible by 75 people. Okay, I won't read the names, um, but you know, it was, uh, it, was made, it was made possible for uh, thanks to the, the guidance of, of these uh, 75 individuals and also the patronage of um, uh, our uh, Photo Island uh, patrons. And uh, there, are, there is a, um, a long list of uh, uh, contributors and supporters uh, to the journal, but the artist features uh, in this issue one of our journal are Bex Butler, Debbie Farrell, Eva Kruger, Francesca Catastini, Gary Laughlin, uh, the Guerrilla Girls, uh, Heather uh, Agipong, Hiro Tanaka, Mark McGuinness, uh, Sia Conlon, Teresa Eng, Theo Ellison, Vera Riclova, and Yvette Monahan. And the texts uh, are by Aidan Kell, Aidan Kelly uh, Murphy, Alison Nordstrom, uh, Amelie Schul, uh, Anna Ernstein, Benedetta Casagrande, Duncan Woolbridge. Uh, who was uh, with us today, today uh, in, in, the, uh, in the session, uh, Eric Bruns, Gloria Yorzabal, who mentioned, by the way, uh, just earlier, uh, so many interesting subjects have gone through. Thanks so much, Heather, Angel, and Aidan. Viva over, Viva Photo Island. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, George Kohlberg and Julia Gelesova, uh, also with the text, and Natasha Christia and Jilin Head. And then the, the interview with uh, Marion Hislin. I think it is quite a, a a lot of work and it's a uh, it's our first um journal so we hope you like it um it is a great opportunity to work with artists like heather so we are super delighted um uh, and yeah we thank you everybody for your support and we hope you enjoy now uh, theo ellison's video which is live in 2020.photoisland.org <laughs>